So good evening to friends uh, in India or Asia, and uh, good morning to uh, friends in uh, US, particularly our speaker, Professor Feng Wen Yang, and good afternoon to colleagues from friends from Europe. Uh, so it's still my pleasure to welcome Professor Feng Wen Yang, which is a very well-known name in the field of spintronics. And uh, it's uh, really nice, and we are thankful to him that he has uh, accepted our invitation and uh, willing to give this talk. So we are all grateful, and on behalf of my W2S team, my co-convener, Dr. Brajbhushan Singh, and my teammates, Pushpendra, Sakti, Ajar, and others, um, I really thank you, uh, Fengwen, for accepting our invitation. So as I said, he is uh, very well known, but as a matter of formality, I will just uh, tell a few uh, lines about his academic profile. So Professor Fengwen Yang received his uh, bachelor degree in, uh, I think, physics from University of Science and Technology of China in 1992. And he obtained his PhD degree in physics from the John Hopkins University in 2001. After a two-year postdoc research in John Hopkins, he joined the Ohio State University as a faculty member in 2003. And now he's a full professor in the Department of Physics. He's the director of Center for Exploration of Novel Complex Materials and an associate director of the Institute for Material Research at the Ohio State University. He has been an IIG co-leader of the Ohio State, MR6, since 2010. The research interests of his group include the growth of single crystalline epitaxial films of metals, oxides, intermetallics, and topological insulators, and the study of their magnetic microtransport, dynamic spin transport, and topological. So with this uh, brief introduction, I again welcome you, Feng Wen. And I, there may be new participants, so I just want to mention that during the lecture, we don't take questions. So uh, you, you can always write your questions in the chat box or just say, I have a question or raise your hand. At the end of the lecture, I will take all the questions one by one. So uh, thank you. And uh, it's all yours, Feng Wen. We are looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to uh, give this uh, Zoom uh, seminar to, the, to your excellent uh, W2S uh, seminar series. So uh, my, the, the, talk, uh, the topic of my talk today is the electrical switching of antiferromagnetic spins in this platinum hematite bilayers. And the hematite is the alpha phase Fe203. That's a very well known uh, antiferromagnet. So this work has been primarily done by my uh, recently uh, P recent PhD student Yang Feng, and then uh, several other my students and postdoc, and as well as my uh, collaborator uh, Professor Jin Wu Huang uh, from the OSU uh, Material Science Department. So, <clears throat> so here's the outline. First, I'll give an uh, introduction to the antiferromagnetic spintronics, um, and then uh, how is that similar or uh, different from the spintronics uh, research based on ferromagnets. And then I'll describe the, the growth and the characterization of the uh, iron, iron oxide epitaxial films grown by our uh, off-axis sputter, sputtering technique. And then I'll present the re, uh, experimental results of the electro switching of the uh, platinum iron oxide bilayers, uh, as well as the control experiment on platinum uh, sapphires, uh, on sapphire, which, is, which has no antiferromagnet just to rule out some of the uh, artificial effect. And then I'll, in the end, I'll present um, on the color simulation of, of the antiferromagnet switching process, and then I'll summarize. So to begin, uh, I'll give a, a, a brief introduction about spintronics. I mean, spintronic has been and the word was uh, coined in, like, uh, in the late 1980s. So it has been over three decades. Um, so why is it important? First, I look at this remarkable uh, success of the semiconductor-based electronics technology. So it, it follows this famous Moore's law, basically the number of transistors in semiconductor devices should uh, approximately double every two years, right? Actually. Sometimes it's like one half year. So it's extremely uh, productive in this technology. And the, the curve you see from the, the bottom one is the number of transistors per, uh, per chip. 
you see that it's, it, it's exponentially grow. Uh, this is the log scale until relatively recently, right? To the, to, in the 2010 or a few years after that. But after that, it actually kind of leveled off somewhat. That's why you see like quad core or eight core processors. That's because where if you continue to push the, the node size, right now, the state of the art probably is like seven nanometers or five nanometers. You don't have much room to go because, you know, one atom is is about two angstrom in size. So you have five nanometers. That means you have twenty five atoms in a row. Device is that small. You're going to run into fundamental challenges. So some fundamentally different technologies need to come up. This is. This happens when the digital, digital economy is booming, actually is accelerating. This is the report from the Time Magazine a few years ago, saying at that time, the digital economy uses one-tenth of the world's electricity. And then you see this, you know, this, this huge server farm by all the major companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, et cetera. All those cloud computing, those 5G, those future technology, they all rely on computing power, right? Storage. So what is the next generation of the technology? So there have been some candidates as laid out by this international technology roadmap, semiconductors. So you, many of you probably know about this carbon base, for example, graphene, nanotubes, other 2D materials. That is a heavily invested, uh, investigated area as the potential for the next generation technologies. Equally important is the spin-based technologies. That's what the spintronics come in. And there are some other candidates, but, but now the other candidates are not as prominent as the top two. So today I'm gonna to focus on the spin-based devices or the spintronic devices. So there has been some uh, remarkable successes for spintronics. Some of the uh, famous example would be the magnetic hard drive. Right now, your computer, my computer, the laptops probably use a solid state drive, which is not magnetic. But if you look at the, the main storage, like the, the, the servers, those big warehouse uh, computing facilities, hard drive, magnetic hard drive is still the main technology because it's durability, this high capacity. So that's what this, and that relies on magnetic information, right? It's magnetic hard drive, it's magnetic film. And then you have this, right now, the, 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 the main technology is that either it's the giant magnetic resistance or tunneling magnetic resistance read head. You can get to this extremely small size. And then there's another technology is the spin transfer torque, which you use spin torque to control the magnetic, uh, the magnetization. And that has been used in this sort of magnetic random access memory. So this is not just the main focus for a big part of the materials research and condensed matter physics. The semiconductor industry has major inve uh, investment in this direction. So this is a table <clears throat> published by two fellows from Intel. Okay? So they laid out the potential technologies beyond CMOS, which is semiconductor based. There are a lot of candidates that are spin based, right? So I'm not going into those details. So why spin based devices uh, are so attractive? So this plot from the same re uh, review article. So the Y axis is the energy used per digit to control one digit, uh, one bit. And then the Y, the X axis is the time. What you want is the, uh, is the fast and the low energy cost. That's why this lower left corner is the desired place to go. So if you, see, if you look at this, the red uh, tokens are all spin-based and the blue are for uh, charge-based. A lot of the candidates are here. Right? So the, so the, the spin-based spin or spintronic devices, uh, they, are, uh, they are the major candidate for future electronic devices. So now let me just use an uh, example about how ferromagnetic based 
uh, symmetronics work. Mostly, they rely on the control, the manipulation of the ferromagnetic magnetization. This is the a cartoon of a magnetic read head in the hard drive. So here is the read head, which can be very small. I mean, the whole thickness of the stack is about a few nanometers. So you can read a very high density. And then below, this is the magnetic disk, which is partitioned into bits, right? And now this is about like a few tens of nanometers. Uh, this is so-called the, the right hand, right? So you need to write information to your hard drive, which this used a coil to send current to gener generate a stream magnet field to flip each magnetic bit. So that is how you control the magnet information and how to read out the magnet information. But this is a coil. This looks like your transformer, actually. It's very energy hungry. So it requires a lot of electricity. So uh, uh, in principle, uh, a more energy efficient option is by using spin transfer torque, which you don't need this coil, this street field. You use the spin torque to switch a magnetic entity, right? So that is the, uh, the ma a major focus of spintronics in the past decade or two. So there are different versions of that. You can use heavy metals like tungsten, cantaloupe, and platinum, or you can use topological insulators, right? So that is very attractive and should be much more energy efficient than using this three field. Now let's focus on antiferromagnet. Antiferromagnets have been, dis have been discovered like uh, many decades ago, six or seven decades ago by this uh, Louise Nail, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1970. It's a fundamentally very important discovery, but because antiferromagnets do not have a net magnetization because they all cancel out each other, the spins, at the microscopic level, you don't have a nanomagnetization. So they behave like a non-magnet. So they don't respond to external magnetic field. So even Nail himself uh, claimed that antiferromagnet, while very interesting, essentially it's useless. That, is that has been largely true until about 20 years ago when antiferromagnets were incorporated into the GMR devices, which serve as not a main information carrier, but as a auxiliary component to pin a ferromagnet. So it is still not an active ingredient of the sphintonic device. So the reason for that is um, it's because they don't respond very well. But that can also be an advantage because it does not get perturbed by the street field, right? There's no street external field has no uh, effect, negative effect on it. And also fundamentally, antiferromagnets can be controlled at a mass fa much faster speed in the picosecond scale as uh, a, a compared to the nanosecond for ferromagnets. And this, this is because it has a fundamental high frequency dynamics in the terahertz range as compared to the gigahertz for ferromagnets. And because of those, it, in principle, it can cost much less energy. So that's why in the recent few years, antiferromagnetic spintronics has been a major direction in the spintronics field. But to make antiferromagnet a useful active element in spintronics, we have to control it. That is not a trivial task. And fortunately, the spin transfer torque we talked about in the previous slide that can control ferromagnet should also work for antiferromagnet. So that is the, the main focus of the field right now. So uh, I'm going to highlight the two major uh, bre uh, breakthrough uh, discoveries in this field. The first one was discovered about five years ago in 2016, published by Bradley et al. So they ch chose a, a very special antiferromagnet, which is a metal. This is a copper manganese arsenide, right, right here. It has a special symmetry. It, it's, uh, it broke the mirror uh, symmetry such that when you pass a current through this a film of co uh, copper manganese arsenide, you can actually flip the antiferromagnetic spins. For example, the, the antiferromagnetic spins can be for example, horizontal when you uh, uh, send a current due to the spin torque, 
it can flip to perpendicular. So you have this 90 degree switching because for antiferromagnet, you go in here to flip it to the other side, that's equivalent, that's not switching. But from here to here is the switching, which can be used to store information. That's what they did. Okay, so here's a right along the vertical line, a right along the horizontal line. So by doing this, because of the special symmetry, they achieved the switching of the antiferromagnetic spins, which is read out by this transverse uh, uh, resistance or voltage. This is like same geometry as the Hall measurement. But so far, there are only a couple, like two and most three such antiferromagnets that satisfy that uh, symmetry requirement. The vast majority of the antiferromagnets cannot do that. And also, you, know, you might know that there are a lot of antiferromagnets way more than the number of ferromagnets. And many of those antiferromagnets are insulators, right? Because of the fundamental uh, interaction, actually it favors antiferromagnets, it uh, favors insulators. So about three years ago, there, there was another report which used, uh, used a nickel oxide, which is an antiferromagnet uh, uh, insulator. And they put platinum on top and patented a similar structure. And they want to switch between these two legs, this uh, red one and the blue one. They observed something similar. This was a, a regarded as a major breakthrough because you can use the same technique to study many more antiferromagnet insulators. Although later on, this this report probably was uh, was has some contamination from the artifact from platinum, but right now it is believed that the antiferromagnet insulators can be controlled and the readout by electrical uh, signals. So that's what I'm, what I'm gonna to focus today, which is on the iron oxide. So the top is a picture of my lab. We have three sputtering system uh, labeled as metal oxide and then L system because it's shaped as L. Also, uh, we have MB system for topological insulators. Uh, this metal chamber, we have the really, uh, clean system, ultra high vacuum, we can get below 10 to negative, we can get into the 10 to negative 11 tor. And this is a, a plasma in case you're not familiar with sputtering technique. So the geometry we use is, uh, we call it off axis. So I'm not gonna get into details about, about this geometry, but this is a very versatile approach to grow high quality crystalline films uh, for many oxides, intermetallics or even pure uh, simple metals. And there are, there are a lot of the details about this geometry uh, was published in this 2018 review articles. All right, so now let's look at the crystal structure of the hematite. Hematite, uh, strictly speaking, has a rhombohedral structure, but um, very often we put that into a hexagonal lattice like this, right? This is the AB plane and this is the C axis. And then these this, uh, <clears throat> brown balls are the iron. In the each AB plane, it is a ferromagnet aligned. So all the spins are parallel. And in the adjacent plane, it is also ferromagnet aligned, but it's opposite to the, to, the, to the first plane. So they alternate between planes. So that's a pretty uh, attractive feature. So we grow uh, the hematite film of tens of nanometers. So this is an X-ray diffraction scan for a 30 nanometer hematite, which uh, capped with a two nanometer platinum. So you can see this is the iron oxide film uh, peak that is 0006 in the hexagonal framework. And this is the substrate uh, of sapphire. Although there's a 5.2% lattice mismatch, the crystal quality of the, the hematite is quite good. So we zoom in at here, we see this, the film substrate peak, sorry, the film peak and all those wiggles on the side, we call them Lowy oscillations. They, when you see those, that typically means you have a very crystalline, highly crystalline, highly homogeneous uh, epitaxial of film. And another way to characterize the quality is by the so-called rocking curve, which is you park your two theta at this position and then, uh, you do the, the, you, the, you rock the sample to, the narrower this peak is, the, uh, 
the better quality it is. I see a hand raised. Uh, should we uh, answer the question now or should that lead to the end of the talk? Uh, no, no, we will take only at the end. Sorry? Oh, we will take the questions at the end of the lecture. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, please uh, yeah, ask at the end of the, uh, of the talk. Okay, so now uh, another way to characterize the surface smoothness is this so-called X-ray reflectivity or XRR. So from this, uh, that's a small angle XRD and you see many wiggles. That is because of the reflection from the total thickness of the film. And from there, we can obtain the thickness of the film and also the roughness, which is off the order of at one angstrom or 0.1 nanometer. So it's very smooth still. So uh, through collaboration uh, with our TEM uh, expert on campus, we did this TEM uh, imaging. So this is the TEM image for the interface between iron oxide and the sapphire substrate. So you see this continuation of the uh, the hexagonal lattice uh, from uh, aluminum oxide to iron oxide. But you see that because of this 5.2% lattice mismatch, essentially every 20 uh, uh, atomic columns, the iron oxide need to uh, disappear uh, one column. That's why there, there's this kind of the blob, the, the blurry blob right here. That is because of the, uh, the relaxation of the film. So, and also there's another image about the platinum iron oxide interface at the top interface. So you can see this is iron oxide is platinum because platinum is polycrystalline. So it's not in the zone, but you still see this atomic planes. Uh, no, although not very clear, but it's, uh, you, you can see the, the layers. All right, another way to characterize the, the surface smoothness is the uh, atomic force microscopy. Here I show two uh, uh, scans for different sizes, uh, the different regions. Uh, one is uh, just the hematite itself, the other one is with platinum. You see this terraces, that is from the substrate, from the, uh, the software substrate. So it's quite smooth. The roughness is about 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers. All right. So now let's look at the in-plane structure. The, the in-plane, the AB plane is a hexagon. So this kind of structure should naturally give you a six-fold or three-fold symmetry because anti magnets pointing this way or that way is equivalent. So we have this three equivalent easy axis, E1, E2, E3. That's why we call it a triaxle, which means when you rotate 60 degrees, every 60 degrees, you have the same anisotropy, which means the antiferromagnetic spins prefer to align along one of the three axes. So we pattern our film into this uh, three, uh, three lines, uh, 60 degrees apart, three channels. And uh, in addition, we pattern the two narrow lines vertically as the Hall probe, so the, the leads for Hall detection. And this is the, 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 the cartoon for this structure and we can apply magnetic field later on and by varying the field. So we can apply a current through any of those three channels along E1, E2, E3, and then detect the Hall uh, voltage, which is a reflection of the antiferromagnetic spin direction. So first, let's look at uh, such an experiment. So this E1, E2, E3 refers to the pulse current, which is the switching electrical pulses along any of the three channels. You can see, so for each leg, we send 10 pulses, right? Uh, each pulse is one millisecond in duration, and then the, the pulse current magnitude is nine milliamp. The channel width is 10 micron. So this is 10 pulses along the E2. So the reading from the hall is, um, uh, through this, uh, as I will describe uh, next, why we can detect it through the hall detection. And then when we change the direction from E2 to E3, we see a jump of the, the hall detection, we call it the RXY. 
And so it jumped at the first pulse and remained the same for the next nine. And then we changed it back to along E2, the pulse current, and it switched back and, and formed this plateau. And then we, when we switch to E1, it get to lower. So, and then a plateau. And so everything is pretty repeat, repeatable. So we have these three states of the Hall resistance. They represent preferred orientation of the antiferromagnetic spins along each, any of those E1, E2, E3 orientations. So why can we detect that through this? And why the current the pulses can switch the antiferromagnetic spins? So now, if you look at this uh, equation from this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this PRL paper, L is so-called a nail vector, which is the two sublattices is M1 minus M2 divided by two. S is the spin for each, uh, uh, each uh, atomic site of iron. Chi is the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility. And that is the second derivative of L cross L. That de describes the dynamics of the nail vector. On the right-hand side, there are three terms. The first one describes the nail vector precessing around the anisotropy field. Okay, that's the, the uh, similar to the Larmor precession in the magnetic uh, dynamics. The second term describes the magnetic damping, where alpha is the damping constant. The third term is the current-induced anti-damping torque. So P is the spin polarization in the platinum at the interface generated by the spin hall effect. Theta is the spin hall angle and J is the charge current, okay? And so this is the anti-damping torque. The end result of this dynamics, this equation is to make the nail vector to be parallel along the current direction. So which means if you send a current along the IP, uh, along the E2, then the, the result will be to switch some of the antiferromagnetic spins to be parallel to E2. So this N is the same as L, right? Sometimes nail vector is referred to as N, sometimes as, as L, uh, they are the same. So how do we detect those? As I mentioned, we detect through the Hall effect. So this Hall effect, since current can only flow in the platinum, not in the hematite because hematite is an insulator. So this has to be through the interaction at that interface. So we can call it a spin hall, anomalous hall effect because it behaves like anomalous hall. Or uh, some people call it transverse spin hall magnetic resistance. They are the same mechanism. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of those and there are a lot of literature about that. So now, this figure is through the electrical control, right? Pulse currents. We also try to control the antiferromagnetic spins through magnetic field. As I mentioned earlier, antiferromagnets typically they don't respond to external field, but sometimes they can respond through the so-called spin flop transition, which means we apply a magnetic field implant. Because the in-plane magnetic anisotropy is pretty weak compared to uh, relatively. So if the, the magnetic field is large enough along this direction, it's going to force the antiferromagnetic spins to be pointing along this way. So it's perpendicular to H. That is energetically more favorable. It turned out that such a critical field for iron oxide in-plane it's very small, it's about a 0 0.3 Tesla. Okay. So here I show three such curves, uh, angular dependence of the Hall voltage or resistance as a function of the field angle in plane. You can see that when this is 0 0.1 Tesla, it does not have a well-defined well feature. But for the one Tesla and three Tesla in plane field, they have this nice cosine two theta which is precisely what we expect from the reading of the antiferromagnetic spins when they follow the orientation of the field, which is perpendicular. So 
based on this, we can finally say when alpha equals 90 degrees, that's when n should point along E2. So that is this blue one. <clears throat> when it's 30 degrees, that should be along E3. And then when it's around 150 degrees, that should be along E1. So that is what corresponding to what we see uh, above there. Okay, so with this uh, measurement, let's see the current magnitude dependence. So this plot shows this platinum iron oxide, 30 nanometer iron oxide, to, uh, two nanometer platinum, as a function of the pulse current. So the previous slide I showed you nine millium, which is pretty small. So let's increase the, the current pulse. We have 10, 12, 14, and 16. You can see there's a qualitatively different behavior. So at a small current magnitude, including the 9, 10, and 12, you see this square wave-like feature, right? We call it step-like uh, switching. But when you get to 16 milliamp, it becomes this uh, sawtooth or zigzag path. So why there's such a qualitatively different switching behavior? So to understand this behavior, we apply an in-plane field because we know an in-plane field that is large enough can control the antiferromagnetic spins. So it does not follow the external electrical current. So we apply a three Tesla field. In principle, it should freeze out the antiferromagnetic spins. So the charge current cannot uh, switch it. So it does that for 10 and 12 milliamps. But for 16, it's essentially the same. So at three Tesla, any of the magnet switching is forbidden. So this 16 milliamp curve is not magnetic in nature. So, and then uh, we plot this uh, switching magnitude. Uh, so function of IP, you can see that this is not that well defined, but uh, when you apply a field, this is exponential. So this is semi-log plot. So we'll come back to that later. So now let's plot this 60 milliamp and 12 milliamp individually by comparing the zero field and three Tesla field uh, switching pattern. For the 60 millitesla uh, milliamp, they are essentially the same. Uh, it's kind of noisy. Uh, they are qualitatively the same. So it does not matter whether you have a field or not. But for 12 milliamp, it's square-like when we have zero field, but it's essentially flat at three Tesla, although you still have a little bit uh, this saltus feature in there. So what is the cause of that? So my student accidentally discovered after they apply a even higher pulse current, like 18 milliamp, and then you go back to measure lower current, like centi milliamp, the, the, cur the switching curve become qualitatively different. So the blue one is a fresh sample, has not seen very high current. It has this sawtooth behavior. But after the 18 milliamp, it becomes this nice step-like feature. And then you apply a field of three Tesla, this becomes flat. So somehow this 18 milliamp high current make a dramatic change to the system, this platinum iron oxide. So we, that's why we call it a melee. So if we compare the fresh sample of the, uh, the 12 milliamp of the before and after the, the kneeling, they're quality uh, similar, but the, after the kneeling, the curve because becomes more well-defined, more square-like without this small uh, sawtooth features. And then when you apply a field, they become essentially flat. So now let's look at after the milling, let's look at the, the switching magnitude from 6 milliamp all the way to 16. And then they are all square, and the magnitude become larger. So the larger signal typically means you have more antiferro magnets that get um, uh, rigid, that get switched. So if we plot the hall uh, voltage, uh, and the resistance as a function of the current. Above eight milliamp, it is linear. Remember, this is a linear, linear plot. That means, that indicates, strongly indicate that 
this linear dependence indicates when you apply a pulse current, the current is proportional to the spins generated in the platinum through this spin hall effect. And that magnitude of the amount of spins is proportional to the magnitude of the spin torque on the antiferro magnet. So you can think of an IP eventually is equivalent to an effective magnetic field, like it does on the ferromagnet. So now let's look at the current dependence of the switching behavior for a, 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 a nine milliamp pulse current. You can see at a 300 Kelvin, it is square. And at, at, when you reduce the temperature from three Kelvin, 300 Kelvin down, the magnitude of the switching becomes smaller, smaller, and eventually it's gone at 200 Kelvin. So for the switching generated by the pulse current, we also need thermal energy. So this is thermally activated, such that antiferromagnets magnet can be switched. So if it's too cold, they are frozen. So we cannot do that. So this is a thermally activated process. So now let's come back to this, uh, uh, this, this uh, sawtooth feature at high current for the fresh sample. What is the cause of that? So we suspect that it's from the platinum, not from the iron oxide. So we deposited a two nanometer platinum directly on sapphire. There's no magne magnetic film. So by, <clears throat> and then we did the same measurement and we found out the same sawtooth feature appeared. So this is nothing magnetic. And then when we lower the current, it, it remains this sawtooth feature, just the magnitude becomes smaller. Then we did this, um, well, here we, have, we plot the magnitude in this semi-log plot. <clears throat> it is uh, 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 exponential dependence. And then we did the annealing. So we can largely reduce the sawtooth, but it's still there. So what we suspect is the, this is, is through this, somebody called it electromigration of the platinum grains or two nanometer platinum. The green size is very small of comparable to the thickness. So, and the, the, when you pass a current, a high current, it's going to move the, the domains, uh, the, the grains, and then sometime maybe make it larger, make it, make it emerge. Somehow, that's why the needle and high current, uh, what it does to the film. So after 18 milliamp, you largely reduce the uh, <clears throat> amount of green boundaries such that you can uh, reduce this uh, electromigration. Uh, so it's reduced this apparent switching signal. So now let's look at the switching magnitude, right? After the 18 milliamp switch, uh, annealing. So now we see this is the linear dependence. So the magnitude at 60 milliamp is about 0 0.02 ohm for the Hall resistance. If you compare that to the field controlled switching, as I showed earlier, when it's saturated, this magnitude from the top to the bottom is 0 0.27 ohm. So the electro switching we measured through the pulse current is less than 10% of what we, what we would get from the field control. So what is the reason for that? So this, keep in mind, we send the pulse current and when we detect, we use a smaller current, much smaller current, without the presence of the, car, uh, the pulse current. So this is equivalent to the, when we measure it, it's at a zero spin torque, or we can call it remnant state. Well, in this measurement, we measure the Hall voltage or Hall resistance in the presence of a three Tesla field. So why there's such a difference? Okay, so my student did this uh, Monte Carlo simulation about the switching process by modeling the Hamiltonian of the hematite. So this is the exchange interaction, right? So that exists in both ferromagnets <coughs> and antiferromagnets. And then this is the, we call it uh, the anisotropy, uh, or let me call, it, this is the in-plane triaxial anisotropy. This is the easy plane anisotropy, or 
sometimes you can call it outer limit isotopy. But this is the dominant term. So in here, we can have an effective field due to the spin orbit torque, right? That's proportional to the Carl's uh, chart uh, pulse current you apply, which is, of course, proportional to the spin hole angle. So let's model this <coughs> effective field, HE effective. And we can uh, model that from, by applying the pulse current. Suppose you can get large enough so you reach a saturation. So everything, let's say along this E3, it, everything is parallel along this E3. But when you remove this pulse current and when you measure the hole, it's gonna come back to the remnant state because the implant isotopy of iron oxide is quite small. So it reduced into a multi-domain state. That's why electro, uh, electro switching, you don't measure a full saturation, but a multi-domain state. For example, if you cannot apply to a very high current, which we can't because we're gonna burn our sample. And then you reduce back. This Monte Carlo simulation shows that your remnant state is even lower. That kind of qualitatively explain why our electrical measurement, the hall signal is much smaller than the, um, than the uh, field control, uh, which is at a saturation state. To do that, we actually um, use field to simulate that. So we can apply a field up to one Tesla, which should fully align the underfermax spin. And then we reduce the field gradually. And then experimentally, we get to zero. We see that the signal of this, uh, the indeed is decreased, right? So that quality will explain the widest signal of the electrical switching is smaller than the field controlled uh, switching. Okay, so now I'm going to come to a summary. So I'm pretty much on time. So I described the, uh, how we grow, grow the, uh, the epitaxial film of hematite, and then we characterize the crystal structure. So for antiferromagnetic control, you, you want your film to be crystalline, crystalline quality to be as high as possible. So the magnetic quality will be homogeneous. And then we characterize this triaxial inflate anisotropy in this uh, iron oxide epitaxial films. So we did the electro switching measurement and we confirmed this tri-state switching and we used the Hall resistance to detect the antiferromagnetic state before and after the switching. And we saw two kinds of switching behavior. One is the salt use, which happened at a high pulse current and then step-like switching, which happened at low pulse current, as well as after we anneal the, the plant film by a high current. And then we investigate the, the current magnitude and temperature dependence to better understand the switching uh, mechanism. And through the control measurement of a single platinum layer directly on sapphire, we, we believe that this sawtooth behavior is largely due to the electromigration of the platinum layer itself. And that uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulations kind of confirm the, uh, uh, what do we see from the uh, electro switching signal? Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop right here. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Penguin, for this uh, very, very nice talk uh, and really summarizing the basics and the developments in this field. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. For everyone. I thank you. And we are now open for questions. Uh, do I have any questions? All right. I, I have actually a few questions. Uh, so uh, uh, I will take uh, some questions from myself. And I request others to either just write a hi or raise your hand and I come back to you. So, um, in, the, uh, so in one of your slides, you saw this uh, equation, uh, the damping, anti-damping uh, equations. So the damping uh, basically comes from where? Because this is an antiferromagnet. So Correct. This, yeah, damping is from the, uh, the hematite. Hematite, okay. So this yeah. is uh, like damping constant of an antiferromagnet. Correct. Okay. And uh, how much it is for hematite, let's say if you want to quantify it? I have, I, okay, so it's not easy to measure those, but uh, uh, 
it's generally believed that for antiviral insulators, the damping is, is relatively uh, small. So I saw some uh, theoretical modeling use something like 0.001. It's like uh, the order magnitude for the damping. So it's lower than, let's say, a lot of the ferromagnet oxides or, or metals. Okay. It's, uh, so it's 10 to the negative three in that uh, neighborhood. Could be, in, could be into the 10 to the negative four. So, but it's not, it's pretty challenging to measure the magnitude of the antiferromagnetic damping. Well, maybe the antiferromagnetic resonance can give some uh, indication of the magnitude of alpha. Okay, uh, thank you. If you go to slide, uh, I, <clears throat> I think uh, the, uh, the same slide actually. So this uh, three-step uh, or the tri-step switching. So I didn't understand why the uh, switching for E1 will be much lower resistance compared to E3 to E2. Any ah, excellent question. So um, let's say, uh, let's say, so when we apply the token along E2, and then when we measure the whole voltage, we send the sensing current also along this horizontal channel, and we measure the whole voltage through here. So this is a perpendicular direction. Suppose when you, when you send a pulse current, the net effect will be your antiferromagnet spin will be along this direction. So the sensing current is the uh, sensing hall voltage will be perpendicular to 90 degrees to the antiferromagnet spins. So that's here. Then when you apply along, let's say E3 first, then you have the 60 degree angle, right? Between the antiferromagnet spin and your, uh, or actually 30 degree uh, under your hall leads. So that give you a higher resistance reading or let's say po more positive hall voltage. And then when you apply along E1, which is on the other side, so that give you a lower one. So to understand this in more details, we need to look at the spin hall magnetic resistance, which involves the spin torque at the interface between platinum and the hematite. So it's through the spin hall effect, when you apply a sensing current, the spin polarization along the uh, in the platinum will be vertical, let's say point up, okay? So, and then it's going to interact with antiferromagnetic spins and generate a, a hall reading. So we did this uh, rigorously before, but I forgot the details. So I said, basically this one and that one give you opposite side of the E2. So that's why E3 is higher, E1 is lower. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe one last question from me before there are questions from others. If you go to the next slide, uh, I think next or next, yes, this one. So you saw the field dependent, the inclined field dependent. So basically, uh, evidencing the spin flop. So yeah. I the 0.3 Tesla is kind of the critical field to make the spin flop. So that's the reason, I mean, I just uh, want to uh, clarify one thing that this is the reason that you don't see any big difference between one Tesla or three Tesla because any field higher than 0.3 Tesla would basically lead to the same effect. Same exactly, results. exactly. I'm right? Yes, yes, you're correct. So the, the spin flop transition field for in-plane is around 0 0.3 Tesla. So yes. any, any practical field above that, you just lock the antiferromagnetic spins uh, at the perpendicular to the, to the field. So that's why one Tesla, three Tesla have no difference because the antiferromagnetic spins just is frozen along that yeah. direction. Yeah, so that I just presume. Thank you. Right. Uh, yep. I will take the question from uh, Q Lee. So, uh, on mute. Uh, okay, I will unmute all. So now, so you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, sir. So, uh, thank you for your nice talk. I have uh, two questions regarding on first uh, platinum thickness. So, have yeah. you tried with the thicker platinum like a five or six nanometer? Because it has been known to that uh, it demonstrate the more efficient uh, spin of to the objection layer. You, so you're in that right. Case also, have you uh, demonstrated such a so tight 
uh, so to like uh, behavior or it's just like uh, there is a, a negligible thermal effect and you just get the clear SOT induced effect. Okay, that's a great question. So, I mean, we did try uh, up to five nanometers. So the, the five nanometer, the, the, uh, you, what you said is correct. But uh, the, the downside is as you go grow thicker, let's say five nanometers, the, the resistance, which is the rho xx of the prime layer is much smaller. It's not just 2.5 times smaller. It's like uh, eight or 10 times smaller. So the much smaller uh, rho xx cause a problem for the hall detection because the hall uh, signal is closely related to the rho xx. So the switching signal becomes much noisy, uh, much noisier, and then uh, eventually just not a high quality uh, uh, data. So that's why we mostly uh, use two or three nanometers. For mm -hmm. the smooth films like this, we stay at, at two nanometer because the simply because the hot signal is much larger. But instead also you have a stronger thermal effect. So as you mentioned, uh, the switching behavior underlying mechanism is the like a thermal assisted or thermal driven switching. Uh -huh. So is it so, thermal? Uh, yeah. So the, the, when I refer to the thermally activity mm -hmm. switching, I think uh, that's, uh, that refers to what happens in the hematite, in the iron oxide. So, uh, so, so this, keep in mind, this is all, okay, next one. This, this, is, this happens uh, at, a, at a, a, we use smaller current and then we vary the, the measurement temperature. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the temperature of the hematite. Okay. At a slow, small current in, in the platinum, the electromagnetic region of a platinum is very minimal. But as you lower the temperature, the antiferromagnet uh, spins are more rigidly pinned, right? either by their anisotropy or by defect in there. So, so the colder you get, the more energy you need to switch it. So this is what I uh, what I call it thermal activity. Oh, so the thermal fluctuation in the in the hematite is important. It need to wiggle due to the thermal activation, and then when the when the charge current comes, it's going to flip it. If originally it's very locked, very much locked, uh, because the temperature is very low, then the charge current needed to switch it need to be much higher to overcome the barrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my second question is regarding the anisotropy. So actually also it is known that it's really hard to get the triaxial anisotropy on this film state. So have you ever characterized the in-plane anisotropy energy and it indeed shows a triaxial property? Um, or, no? So let me, let me uh, so the, the triaxial, so, so when we saw this kind of behavior, Mm -hmm. We know that the three axes are not, uh, there are three stable states. So, and also when we patented the sample, my students uh, measured which direction is this, right? So, so basically which direction the crystal structure is this edge. So they patented the, the, this uh, three channel mm -hmm. along this direction, right? This easy axis. Uh, so our evidence is through these three levels, right, of the Hall resistance. So other than that, so the fuel control, we cannot measure the triax and uh, So mm -hmm. the only evidence we have is the Hall resistance. How can we independently measure the triax and NSHB? We haven't done it. Mm -hmm. Okay, because and it it's not clear how we can measure it. <laughs> okay, because uh, I remember uh, so on top of this uh, typical sapphire substrate, which typically has a slight miscut, so it induces a yes. specific uh, orientation of the iron oxide. Absolutely. Yep. So it has a typical unexual anisotropy. So that's why I'm surprising to see this one actually. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're you're correct. So we have we have seen this three step uh, transition. Uh, three level polarism in some of the samples, but not in all our samples. So in, in some samples, let's say one of the, the switching is much weaker, while the other two are more, more dominant. 
I suspect that's due to this, uh, the, the quality and the nature of the substrate surface. But uh, we did see, uh, we did, we have seen repeat, repeatedly that uh, it has three states. Although this is just a more even distribution of the, for this particular sample. For some other samples, sometimes we can only see clear switching between two states, the two, okay. two orientations. Okay, okay, very clear. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, so Pranab, uh, please unmute and ask your question. Uh, hello, Professor Yang, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I had a few questions. Uh, I was wondering, uh, did you try the, to confirm that this switching is due to the spin orbit torque? Uh, did you try, for example, changing platinum to tantalum and see some reversal? Uh, because of the uh, different sign of spin hollow angle in platinum and tantalum? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. So my student did use tungsten, which is similar to tantalum. So, and he saw similar switching behavior. Although, I mean, tungsten, they kind of, for two nanometer, we only measured a very fresh sample and after some time it getting oxidized, but we did see that. But because of this, this, uh, this switching, so the switching of antiferromagnet is different from the ferromagnet because antiferromagnet, the spins are this. So the switching, if, if, if it's a, let's say for platinum, it's a spin up, well, for tungsten spin down, it gives you the similar effect. It just wanna pull it along that direction. So tungsten and platinum show similar behavior. Okay, okay. So- uh, You know, you can think of this as a, Theta spin hall squared. So the sign of this spin hall angle got canceled. So they 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 behave similar. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So yeah, interesting. So I was wondering the thickness uh, for this um, uh, alpha APTO3 that you use is thirty nanometer. Uh, yeah. I thought it's very thick to switch. So it is likely that you are just switching at the interface. Sir. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we, 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 we thought about, it. yeah, we discussed that. So that is, I believe, a major difference between iron oxide, uh, sorry, between antiferromagnet and ferromagnet. You might think that iron oxide, 30 nanometer is thick. So we did a, a thickness dependence uh, on the, uh, the hematite film. So we, we did something like 10 or 15 nanometer up to 100 nanometers. Well, because below 10 or 15, the the, the, the film quality is not as good because that interface. But from something like 50 nanometer to 100 nanometers, the switching current required is not that different. So this is very different from ferromagnets, which should be inversely proportional to the thickness of the ferromagnet. Because in ferromagnet, the energy is, should be proportional to the volume of the ferromagnet. But for antiferromagnet, somehow it has a very weak thickness dependence, probably because it does not have this magnetostatic energy, because it does not have street field. You mentioned that it could be that you only switch a very thin layer near the interface. I think that's a little unlikely, because if that is the case, then you have a domain wall. So although there's no, uh, Street field, but this domain wall, this, this rotating antiferromagnet spins, costs a lot of the exchange energy. So I think it's that the whole 30 nanometer film should switch uniformly, although laterally, some area can switch, some area probably does not, depending on the current density. So mm -hmm. that is why we see that the remnant state, it breaks into multiple domains. Well, just you have a slight preference along certain direction. I see, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's very interesting. Uh, so uh, have you tried any, uh, I mean, uh, to get this antiferromagnetic order, uh, maybe there are possible that some samples do not have the antiferromagnetic order, then you don't see the switching. Uh, was that uh, need a lot of optimization before you could see this uh, switching behavior? You mean uh, optimize, optimization of the, the hematite film? Yeah, yeah, growth. Oh yeah, so uh, 
so in the earlier, okay, earlier stage of this experiment, so my students saw, sometimes saw this uh, mostly, this kind of sawtooth behavior, right? And because that is what is being reported in the literature. So we thought that is the, the, the actual switching signal. And they, my students did a lot of re reiteration. Sometimes, very often they see this. Sometimes they see a pretty strange behavior while optimizing the film. And eventually the film quality got a pretty consistent. And then, so they were able to explore different pulse current, density, and duration, a lot of parameters, and eventually they figure out that what is going on. Uh, so we, we need uh, anti-ferromagnetic films uh, with as high quality as possible. So that, that is generally true for a lot of the magnetic films, mm -hmm. especially oxides. Yeah, yeah. okay, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for these nice discussions. I think I don't see any more questions. So uh, we will conclude. Uh, can you please uh, stop sharing, uh, Penguin? I yep. like my screen uh, to present a small token of appreciation. And I should also announce that next week we will have the talk by Professor Manuel Vives, uh, but it will be at 3 p.m. Indian time, uh, our regular time. Yeah, the 8 p.m. is only for the speakers from US. So, uh, <coughs> so do you see my screen, Penguin? Yes, I did. I'm doing. I I I I see it. Yes, it's a uh, very small to kind of appreciation a digital plaque from our mm. team. So I will just read it for you. Uh, the Thank you. Seminar webinar series on spintronics, uh, nicer wood, nicer India. Takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Penguin Yang from the Ohio State University in US in recognition and appreciation for being a very valuable speaker to give a lecture on electrical switching of antiferromagnetic spins in platinum iron oxide binders. So thank you very much uh, for your really excellent talk. It was very enjoyable and uh, very uh, active discussions. We enjoyed and we hope uh, sometime when uh, the time zone uh, matches uh, convenient for you Hopefully you can join the lectures and we hope uh, that someday we will meet in person, maybe in India or in the United States uh, or other places. But uh, until then, uh, please stay safe and uh, see you next week, guys. Thank you so much, Penguin, again. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.